Chad HD Show News Talk 95.1 FM and 790 AM KFYO. We go to the phones and GOP political strategist Matt Makoviak on the phones with us. Matt, good morning. How are you? I'm doing great, Chad. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. It's uh, it, it's always it's always busy. Uh, there's always uh, two or three things going on. I guess let's start with the Supreme Court. Uh, President Trump gets another pick for the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, Susan Collins was out yesterday on a couple of the Sunday morning uh, television shows, saying that uh, she's you know she's there, there are people on Trump's list that she could not vote for. And uh, that she's not going to vote for anyone who just comes out and says that they're going to overturn Roe versus Wade, which is not too surprising. Yeah, I mean, this is the, you know, this is the challenge, right? Um, you have a fifty-one forty-nine margin, uh, Republican margin in the Senate. You only need a majority uh, to confirm a new Supreme Court justice. John McCain is currently a U.S. senator, but he's not able to vote, and it's not clear that he'll be able to vote, and it's not clear. What his, uh, you know, what his prognosis is at the moment, except that it's dire. So there's a pretty narrow margin for Republicans, and so, uh, you know, one of the challenges they have is that you have two moderate Republicans who are ostensibly pro-choice in Susan Collins of Maine and Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. If Republicans lose those two votes, the Trump's, you know, nominee to replace Anthony Kennedy would not be confirmed. Now, look, ultimately, I don't think it's going to come to that. Uh, I think probably what will happen is they'll nominate someone that both those senators can be for, probably someone who doesn't have a record of, of uh, voting, or excuse me, of, of ruling on any abortion-related cases. Um, and I think even more than just those two moderate Republicans uh, voting for the, the ultimate justice nominee, I think that uh, you'll have at least three and maybe as many as five or six Democratic senators vote for that nominee. Remember, you had three Democratic senators vote for Gorsuch. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Collins has said she believes that Roe versus Wade is uh, precedent and that precedent should not be overturned. So she's going to want a, a justice who, number one, uh, doesn't uh, have strong pro-life views probably, uh, but two, uh, respects precedent. And that was the case with Gorsuch. I imagine that's the kind of justice they'll find to nominate. But let me also just say, Chad, um, this this uh, Supreme Court vacancy is a massive uh, story. Um, it will have sweeping ramifications for a generation. Uh, it has political benefit for Republicans, certainly for the midterms, by energizing the base, reminding them that Trump and the Republicans are working together uh, and delivering. Uh, and it also has the potential to shift the court somewhat to the right, because Anthony Kennedy had been uh, conservative on some issues, but more moderate or even liberal on social issues. And if you have more of a social conservative justice get confirmed, it would go from a 5-4 socially liberal uh, majority to a 5-4 socially conservative majority. So um, we're going to have probably the biggest political battle in my lifetime over the next three months. Uh, it's going to be uh, unbelievable uh, how much money is going to be spent, uh, how aggressive both sides are going to be. But ultimately, the Republicans, I think, have are holding the cards here. And are, have, as long as they put a good nominee forward, that person is very well vetted, and that person handles their confirmation hearing well, uh, ultimately, I think they will be confirmed with 53, 55, 58 votes. And, and, and Matt, let, let's go back to something that you said. Uh, Senator Cornyn over the weekend, he was hit by a group uh, here in Texas for saying that, you know, the his advice to the president would be someone who doesn't have a public record commenting on Roe versus Wade. Uh, you know, that, that was sort of his statement. He was hit by by that group because, uh, you know, basically they, they were trying to argue that, you know, Cornyn didn't want a pro-life judge, which is, in, in my opinion, that's not what he was saying. Um, and, right. and, and that's not – I've interviewed so many judicial candidates – they don't want to comment on specific cases because then they can't be viewed as a judge. <laughs> they, they've right. already issued a statement. And I think that's where Cornyn was coming from. And that's basically what I'm hearing from you is uh, that, yeah, the judge is probably going to be pro-life, probably going to be very socially conservative, but there's not going to be all these public records and public comments saying that. No, that's exactly right. Um, and you know, probably the worst thing Trump could do politically from a simple math uh, uh, standpoint in the Senate would be to nominate uh, someone who is aggressively pro-life and has ruled in an aggressive pro-life way, only be, not because there's any ideological problem with that. I'm obviously 100% pro-life, but because it, it would create 
Uh, number one, it will create a rallying cry for Democrats, including probably some Democrats you could perhaps win. But even more so is it would uh, give Collins and Murkowski a reason to vote against the nominee. I mean, look, there is obviously a slight chance here if Republicans cannot confirm this nominee that this thing boomerangs against them. And it turns out to be a disadvantage rather than an advantage. I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're going to try to basically recreate the Gorsuch playbook, mm-hmm. find someone who is stellar, uh, who has uh, you know, a, a personality that will put, put senators at ease, someone that's solid, but someone who has not taken a lot of controversial stands uh, necessarily uh, to, to give their, the opponents reasons to shoot at them. So no matter who it is, I mean, you're already seeing Democrats oppose, you know, the nominee, no matter who it is, the nominee right. hasn't even been named. There's a list of 25 people, probably five or six of which are, are really being considered. And, and of course, the president will make his announcement uh, one week from today. Yeah, it's going to be something to uh, to watch and see. Uh, let's also uh, talk about this this push by some Democrats, uh, the, the rallying cry to abolish ICE. Uh, I saw an opinion piece on CNN today, of all places, CNN, that is, is urging Democrats to pump the brakes on this whole thing, that this is not a good idea. Uh, the president over the weekend said, hey, this is great. Keep talking about it, Democrats. This is going to be great for the midterms. Uh, are, are the Democrats overplaying their hand big time on this one? I think they are, yes. Uh, I don't think there's 15% of the country that believes I should be abolished. abolished. Um, and one of the things that, that, that uh, Democrats oftentimes – uh, recoil at is when someone claims that they are uh, open borders. They are, they're supportive of open borders. Um, I'm not sure that I understand the distinction between open borders and abolishing ICE. There's not a whole lot of territory in between those two positions. If you don't have an agency that is uh, enforcing the laws, the laws which Congress writes, um, then having a border doesn't really matter very much. Uh, you know, so. Uh, this is a position that has been, you know, advocated for by, you know, far left elements in the Democratic Party. Uh, it's gotten a lot of attention in the last week because of this congressional candidate in New York, Alexand- uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who took out the number four ranking Democrat, uh, Joe Crowley, in a primary. But you're already seeing, you know, sitting United States senators with presidential ambitions uh, talk about abolishing ICE. Kirsten Gillibrand from New York has taken that position. Kamala Harris from California has called ICE a terrorist organization. Um, I'm old enough to remember when Democrats believed that they were the party of government and Republicans were the party of not wanting, you know, uh, government. Uh, and it seems like maybe in this case things have, have you know, turned, turned around. I don't know what Democrats are going to do about this, but I do know that Democratic strategists believe this is a loser uh, for them. And so they're going to need to find a way to rein, the, rein Democrats in, uh, particularly candidates. But I think you're going to see these presidential candidates continue to take the position that ICE needs to be abolished. Now, that, that gives Trump uh, an upper hand to play against Democrats to show that they're weak on security. That'll be helpful in the midterms. Um, and and it also, I think, again, will lead to d- division within the Democratic Party at a time where they need to be unified for the midterms. Are you as interested in this little battle brewing between Ocasio-Cortez and Nancy Pelosi as I am? Because this, I, those two just, they don't like each other. And it seems as though eventually the media is going to have to talk about this division inside the Democratic Party. Well, yeah, I mean, they are talking about it a little bit. But one of the things you're seeing is you're seeing incumbent members of Congress who are Democrats not distance from themselves from policy for the most part, but but challengers, you know, new candidates are, particularly younger candidates who believe it's time for a new generation of, of leadership. Um, I believe if Democrats take the House back, Pelosi will be Speaker. I don't believe that they'll dump her. Um, I do believe if they don't take the House back, there's a good chance that she won't be minority leader, that she'll be dumped. Mm. But but really, it depends exactly what the numbers are and where some of these, uh, you know, which challengers win and who they're aligned with. Uh, Pelosi doesn't like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez because she took out uh, one of her lieutenants. Mm. Uh, Joe Crowley was very close to Pelosi and was rumored to be her uh, sort of preferred successor at the time, at whatever time, you know, her succession would occur. So, uh, but, but, but look, this is the, the, this is the dilemma the Democrats have. Pelosi is a great fundraiser, but she's also kind of a mess from a messaging standpoint. She creates television ads almost for Republicans almost every time she talks. And so, uh, but, but you did see even this week, President Obama, a former President Obama came out and supported Pelosi again and said she needs to, to lead the party, uh, after the midterm. So, 
uh, yeah, there is a Democratic uh, there Democratic Party division going on right now, uh, and it's going to be very interesting to watch as we continue to see more primaries uh, take hold over the next two months. Yeah, Matt McCoviak, GOP political strategist, thank you very much for your time. Matt, tell folks where they can sign up for your newsletter and the subject of your uh, podcast. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we do a morning email newsletter for the state of Texas. We take all the news, put it in one email, and send it out to our subscribers every weekday. It's called Must Read Texas. You can sign up for a free one-week trial at mustreadtexas.com. My podcast is called Mac on Politics. Uh, we just uh, finished our 89th episode. Uh, it's with Mona Sharon, who is a author and columnist and just wrote a book called Sex Matters. She argues that modern feminism is actually very bad for women, and, and we get into a lot of subjects uh, in that, that uh, conversation. It's on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and on the web at maconpoliticspodcast.com. Very good. Matt, have a great week. We'll visit with you here in two weeks, actually. Sounds good, Chad. Take care. All right. Thank you. That's Matt McCoviak, Chad H.T. Show, KFYO.